last uh, four weeks, this is the fifth week, we've been talking about being refreshed, right? And, and how God desires that for us so much. That he wants us to, to love our lives and to be there and be fulfilled. And ultimately that refreshment only comes through God, right? We reiterated that a bunch last week. All the lessons are online at DenverChurchOfChrist.org if you want to listen to those. Kind of catch up if you missed. But, but we talked about how this door of refreshment, we only get to that through a door marked what? Repentance. Oh man, we're having all kinds of awesomeness here. So uh, if you go up, see where the, the X is in the upper right hand corner? Hit the thing just to the left of that. You don't have a mouse. A little more, there, there, right there. Ta-da! I was wondering why I was getting weird looks, and now it makes sense. Um, but if you go into, hit escape, go into Pro Presenter, clear, clear all, and make it work. There you go. So anyways, we're uh, talking about re- refreshment. It comes through repentance. And if you, if you like and you go, you know what? I'm really messed up and I make mistakes. You know what? You are in good company, right? Because we are far from perfect. But we love each other and are made whole by an awesome God. And so ultimately God's goal in refreshment is he goes, man, I want each and every one of you to be fulfilled. But that only comes through this door marked repentance. And God says, hey, if you repent... And you're changed by me, that times of refreshing come from me. And ultimately, that's what God wants. As he looks and he goes, hey, if you want to be changed in your thinking, we, we de- you went through and defined all of that, and metanoia means to be changed in, in all of that. Why don't you just shut down ProPresenter, and then you don't have to worry about it. How's that? There's music playing in the background, and it's messing everybody up. Or unplug it, and we'll just go on. I'll skip my video. That's totally fine. But, um, you, but all of that is good that God meets us where we're at, cl- cleanses us with technical difficulties and everything else, and ta-da, it's back. Uh, you know, but, but I go, it is great to be able to have a team, too. And we've talked about how, what repentance is and what repentance was not. We talked about how we can be refreshed and repent personally. We also talked about how we, as a church, need to repent collectively. That most of the time that it talks about that is, is us together. And so it's helpful to have other people, you know, there to be able to do that. Just as, you know, um, Randy and, and Dean are there to help me, you know, fix, fix my problems. But this, the final week, we're going to be over in Luke chapter 15. So if you want to turn on your Bible or turn over in your Bible to Luke chapter 15, we're going to talk about that. Of when we repent and when God is the only one who really truly gives us that, right? That we can't do it on our own. God supplies it. God gives it to us. That ultimately, God's goal in that is it produces celebration. So we want to talk this morning about celebrate repentance. Because it's truly one of the great gifts that God has given us. And in Luke chapter 15, it it gives us a great little understanding of this. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, it gives us this great before picture of here's what happens before repentance. And it's awesome as we look in this and we'll see this together of what happens here. It says, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth on wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So that's a pretty bad picture of the before. Uh, of, of what was going on in this guy's heart. And, and what are some things that we see from this scripture? Well, it's kind of interesting because, one, you see that this kid is pretty entitled. Right? He, he was entitled and feeling like, hey, I deserve this. Dad, you're not dying soon enough. I normally get the inheritance after you kick the bucket, but you're not doing that. Can I just have it now? Now, surely that doesn't sound like anything like what our teen ministry would ever think or do that. You know, we we never struggle with an entitlement problem, right? With I deserve this and how come my parents are so silly and I don't get this from them and they should do this and I got this coming to me and I've worked so hard my whole life. I'm 16. Why don't I have a car that's all my own? I don't know. Am I striking a nerve at all? Right? You know, and and we get this idea that, hey, we're entitled to all these things that God goes, "Mm, not so much. 
So then the next thing he does is he, he just runs away. He goes, okay, I, I deserve all this, and, and now I've got it, so let me just take off. Let me go and do my own thing, because clearly you guys are just so stupid. You don't know what's going on, and I am obviously smarter than y'all. And so they just run away. He runs away from his problems. He runs away from this issue. He runs away from what actually could really help him. And I go, does that not sound like us as well? Where we look and go, God, how come I don't have this thing? I deserve this. And maybe it doesn't go exactly our way. Maybe it's not exactly what we thought we were signing up for. Maybe life is going in a a direction we thought, this wasn't supposed to be how it was going to happen. And I didn't like what what, what was going on here, God. And and I deserve something better. And so he just decides, I'm going to just run away and I'm going to figure this out on my own. And it doesn't go so well for him, right? Because ultimately he ends up living in the pig pen. Right? Where we just think, you know, here's what's going to be awesome. This is going to work out perfect. And my very best thinking has gotten me to this point of, of how this is going to work. And he does that same thing and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get everything that I have coming to me. I deserve it. Then I'm going to take it and just use it to have a good time. And what does God do? God loves him. And so God allows him to deal with the consequences of his stupid decisions. And I don't know if you've ever had anything like that, where I go, I mean, I've had plenty of those where I just go, yeah, I think I made a mistake. And and God reiterates that not by punishing me, but by saying, well, you made a bad decision. Let me let you deal with the consequences of that bad decision. You know, and I go, that's not our favorite thing to do in the whole wide world. But God loves to be able to, to teach us, disciple us, and help us with that. And sometimes living in the pig pen is the very best thing that we can do. But what does living in the pig pen help us do? Man, it helps us come to our senses. It helps us go, oh, wait a minute. Something isn't quite right here. Maybe this isn't what God intended for me. Maybe this isn't what God wants for me. And so he does this. He, he comes to his senses in, in Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 20. It says, when he came to his senses... He said, how many of my father's hired servants had food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. You know, and you just see him in his heart here going, this isn't working for me. This isn't what I wanted. And, and he comes to his senses. Have you ever had a moment like that? Where things are confusing and it's not quite clear and you don't know what's going on exactly. And then all of a sudden you have this epiphany where you just go, I know what I need to do. And sometimes we think it's we're so smart. I think as we talked about repentance, that God is only one who does that. That God is the only one who can truly help us to change like that. To have this cosmic mind shift, to have a paradigm shift where we're completely changed and we're completely thinking in a different way. Because without that, there's no way that we could do it. There's no way that we could think through all these things without God truly helping us. And I go, that's the only way that we can truly change. Is having this cosmic mind shift, this paradigm shift, this this ability to change and be different than what we are on our own. That's the only way it really works. So, what is that? On the count of three, shout it out. One, two, three. Well, depending on who you are, it's either a duck or a rabbit. Right? Oh, now it makes sense. If you squint, do you see the duck? Or do you see the rabbit? Okay, so who who saw rabbits first? Raise your hand if you saw a rabbit first. If you saw the duck first. Do you see them both? What if you don't... If you only see one, you don't have to raise your hand. Um, uh, It's hard sometimes you go, well, I think I knew what that was, but I'm not totally sure. And it's interesting. Okay, so same thing. We're going to, new picture, count of three, we're going to call out what we think it is. One, two, three. Okay, so lots of people see an old lady. Who sees an old lady? Lots of people see a young lady. Who sees the young lady? Do you see both? So if, it's, if you see the young lady, she's looking away, kind of her, her left shoulders to us. She's looking to the back over her right shoulder. If it's the old lady, she has a rather prominent schnoz. Uh, you know, her nose is, is rather big there. Okay, but what's this? 
Do you know what that is? Can you tell? Can you make it out? How about now? It's a bad rendition of a bicycle, okay, right? But it's interesting. In psychology, in psychology they call this a gestalt switch. See, once you see that rabbit or the, the duck, and now then you see both, you go, oh, I know they're both there. You have this cosmic transformation where you just go, this paradigm shift, this thinking change. And I go, that's what God does to us sometimes. Maybe you've had a math problem where you're looking at it and you're just so frustrated. and you're, Or maybe as a kid, you're, you're trying to help your kids and you were having the really difficulty as a parent. And you're like, well, you should study this out. And you get on YouTube to try and figure out how to do it because you have no idea either. <laughs> Guilty as charged. Um, you know, but, but you have these things where you look at something and you go, I have no idea what that is. And then all of a sudden, we come to our senses. All of a sudden, God goes, let, let me give you a little glimpse of what I'm really trying to do here. You, maybe you're having a, an issue in your marriage. And you're positive it's the other person. And then God loves you enough to help you repent, to have this cosmic change in your thinking. To go, you know what? What if it's my problem? What if I were to take responsibility for my part in this? And you have this cosmic mind shift of, ooh, it's repentance. That's all it is. And God goes, help me, let me help you repent in this. Let me help you change so you can view this differently. Or maybe as a teen, you go, my parents just hate me and they're just trying to control me and, and they just don't like me. How many adults in here at some point thought their parents were bad and they didn't like them and they didn't, weren't helpful and they were just trying to punish them? And they didn't, you know, they were, didn't have their best interest in mind. One, two, three, raise your hand if you were like that as an adult, okay? We all think that, right? We've all do that. And at some point, all of us go, you know what? My parents did, did understand this. Man, they really did have their mind, mind straight in this. They're not as silly as I thought they were. It's a great moment when we come to that and we think through that. And, and I go, there's times where God is doing that same thing for us where he says, hey, let me have, help you have this, this paradigm shift where you're looking at it differently and you're, you haven't been able to figure it out and I want to help you figure it out. Because ultimately, that's what this younger son does. God helps him come to his senses. Why? By living in a pig pen. He runs away. He lost everything that he had because he made bad decisions. And God says, he's never going to fix this on his own. Let, let me help him. Let me give him this cosmic mind shift, this cosmic change, because clearly he's not figuring this out on his own, and I really want to help him to do that. And so he does. He gives him this, this mind change that helps change who he is. And what's really cool, there's a great video of this from one epic movie that you may or may not like, but I, I go, here, here's a great little video clip of this idea from the matrix, <laughs> the red pill or the blue pill. Little audio. The matrix is it. Okay. It's not going to work. Luke 15. Technology is not meant to be. The whole video, what happens? He comes to him and says, hey, do you want to know what the matrix is? And it's this, this wool that's been pulled over our eyes. We've been tricked to think the world around us is reality, and it's not. We're actually all born into bondage. We're all born into slavery. And we're all slaves to this. It's really what that before picture looks like when we're not understanding what God is trying to do and who God is and how he wants to save us. The wool's pulled over our eyes and we're slaves to sin. And he says, hey, you can, you can take one of two pills here. And if you take the blue pill, you'll go back to the, the way you were. And you just everything will be the way it is. And it's kind of like when we sit down and we study the Bible and, and we see what God is calling us to do. We see who the God of the scriptures truly is. We see the amazingness of who Jesus is as a man. And we say, do I want that or do I want to throw it away? Or we can take the red pill. Where it says the veil's been lifted and we get to see what's really going on. But once you go, you, you can't ever go back. And I love one line in the movie where it says, you, nobody can tell you what the matrix is. You have to live it. You have to see it. And that's truly the Christian life. You know, you go, wow, well, I just want to come to Sunday and figure out how to live the Christian life. Doesn't that work? That's a piece, but you're never going to be able to, to see it until you do it. And that's where this cosmic mind shift comes, where if you go, I just can't overcome this, and I don't know what to do, and I can't figure out how to forgive, I can't figure out how to overcome, I can't figure out how to listen to God, I just don't know what to do. The only way to do that is to live it out. And the cool part is, is as a church, we don't just say, hey, figure it out, Hope you, good luck with that, see you next Sunday. We're in each other's lives, we're trying to be family. 
You know, this Sunday, right after church at 1230 over in the fellowship hall, the In Motion ministry is going to continue their, their, uh, their series, I guess is what you call it, is that series, class. But this week is on forgiveness. And I think the power of forgiveness is truly amazing when we feel it. The, the power in a lack of forgiveness is truly amazing when we feel that too. And so if you haven't been going to In Motion or if you're just hearing about it for the first time, you're totally invited. They've got lunch provided. Um, and they're going to just talk about forgiveness and how we can own that and how we can feel that from God and how we can forgive other people even if they're not here anymore. But I'll tell you what, the freedom that comes from true forgiveness, either when we receive it or we, we give it, is amazing. It'll help you so much to be able to do that. So if you go, I'm really stuck. I don't know how to do this. Man, go to that. It'll help you so much. Or you go, I don't know how to pray and, and hear what God is saying. Have you ever felt like that? You just go, man, I'm stuck. I don't know. I'm not sure what he's trying to say here. I don't know what he's trying to do. Is that, is that God speaking to me or is that like bad Subway sandwich I had for lunch? <laughs> right? And we, we just, we, we minimize what God's trying to do. And we've been asking people to pray, right? What is God pleased with? What is he not pleased with? What is his plans for my life? And what are hindrances to those plans, right? As we've encouraged people to pray. Well, the prayer ministry is going to meet in 109 and 110 at 1230 to say, I don't know how to really hear that. Well, you can sit down with somebody and learn how to pray some in that and really hear what God's trying to say because it's so important. It's what we're trying to do. We can't be changed on this with just us. You can't be good enough. You can't try hard enough. It's only God who does it. Amen? And so we were allowed to do that. So let's, we, we looked at this before picture. We looked at him coming to his senses. And what happens when you do both of those things? Man, it, it sets off a party in heaven. And we all love a good party. Luke chapter 15 and verse 20. It says, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring him the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. How cool is that? And at this point, at the beginning of this story... Jesus uses this before example of saying, hey, there, there was this, this, uh, this shepherd who had some sheep and he lost one. There was this gal who had a coin and she lost it. And then he goes into this story. And I'm sure some of the, some of the, uh, the Pharisees, kind of the religiously prideful people of the time, started thinking, I know this story. They're going to get theirs. Because of verse 1 of chapter 15, they started looking at Jesus and they go, this guy welcomes... And eats with sinners. Oh my goodness, God forbid. Right? Don't touch them, you might get dirty. Right? Holy people are supposed to be with holy people. That's what Sunday's for. Don't let any of the bad people come in. That was their view because they were religiously prideful. They were full of churchianity, not, not being disciples of Jesus. And I just go, that's not what God wants for us. That's not what his goal is. That's not what he's looking for. And I go, so, so, so what does he do? He uses these two examples. But see, the Pharisees knew this story. And the story went that this son who went away came back and asked for forgiveness. The the dad would open the door, spit in the face of the son, and say, I have no son. You are dead to me. Slam the door. And they would be living righteously by letting that son get what he deserved. And so I think a lot of the Pharisees were thinking, oh, I know where this door is going, and it's a good one. And so Jesus does what he always does and kind of flips it over and messes them up and says, But that's not the God we serve. The God we serve says, hey, while you're still a long way off, I'm this watchful father. I'm going to run to you. I'm going to pull you in. I'm going to be this watchful father that just says, I just can't wait for you to come back. But you don't understand what I've done, dad. But, but let's, get the, let's get you cleaned up. Let's put sandals on your feet. Let, let's help you come in because you were dead and now you're alive and I'm so excited that you're back. And this dad is just eagerly watching, eagerly waiting. That's the kind of God that we serve who says, I just can't wait for my little ones to come back. It's why he gives us those two examples of, uh, of this searching shepherd. He says, I got 99 sheep, one gets lost. 
And what would we go? Well, that's good odds. It's just 1%. Let it go. And what does that shepherd do? He goes, no, I'm going to leave the 99. They're going to be able to take care of each other. They're going to be there. They're a great family. They'll, they'll connect. They'll, they'll be there be able to meet each other's needs. They must have had great family groups set up already in that, that little sh- that herd, right? But he says, I've got to go find that one. And I'm going to search. And I'm going to find it. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to scold it and beat it when I find it. No, he says, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to put it on my shoulders. And I'm going to carry it back to the family. And then I'm going to have a party because, look, I found my one lost baby sheep. Because that's the image of the God we serve. Or he says, if that one doesn't work for you, if those two don't fit with you, he goes, this diligent woman who has a really gold, a gold coin, she goes, I'm excited and I lose one. If you lose something valuable in your house, what do you do? You tear that joker up until you find it, right? I'm going to go through, I'm going to sift, I'm going to find, I'm going to search, I'm going I'm to dig, I'm going to look under everything, and I'm going to blame my husband because he probably lost it anyways. <laughs> Guilty as charged. But I go, that's what God is like. This God who says, man, that one is so important to me. That one coin, I got other ones, but none of them are as valuable as that one to me. And then he says, but, but let me really solidify this. And what does that gal do? She throws a party too. She says, hey, come on over. Let's have a party because I found my coin. And what does this one do? See, the first two, you go, well, maybe they just wandered and they got lost. The second one, well, she, it was her fault maybe. It, 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 she dropped it and it got lost. This one, she made the decision. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to squander what God has given me. And see, that where it gets harder That's where we go, can I forgive myself? Will God really forgive me? Or am I just done? But see, all of those show us that repentance brings celebration. Not just in our own lives, but in heaven. It goes, man, this is incredible. Look at what God has done. And that's what God wants to do. And that's what God wants us to find. You know, over the next couple weeks and our midweeks, this week we're meeting men, the women Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and next week we're meeting men Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Tuesdays up north, Wednesdays is right here. And we've been praying about this, asking God to reveal to us kind of what is he pleased with? What's he not pleased with? What are his plans for my life, and what are hindrances to those plans? We ask you to really think about it, pray about it. What are those things that, 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 that are keeping you from the celebration, from the refreshment, from the repentance that God wants? And we're going to have a time of prayer and worship and talking about this. And if you go, I don't want to talk about it in front of everybody, you don't have to. But I go, corporately us repenting, corporately us changing, the community of believers coming together and going, I know what I want to do. I know what I believe God is telling me I need to do. And this is how he's changing me. And this is how I've overcome. This is how I've been refreshed. It has been so encouraging. Hearing what different people are feeling. What different people are doing because they go, man, I've just, I've changed my thinking on this and it's been so freeing. I've been going to the prayer ministry, I've been going to in motion, or I've I've gotten online and setting captives free and I'm going through this thing and I just want to glorify God with my life and I'm helping to overcome these sins by God just changing my thinking. See, that's not doing penance. That's not beating ourselves up. That's being changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ that was raised by the power of a holy God. And that's what God wants for us. That's what God wants us to do. And if you go, you know what? I like the idea of that. I got dragged here by somebody else this, this Sunday. But I want, you to, I want you to help connect with us as a church. And if you just will text, you can pull out your cell phone. You can pretend like you're doing something else if you want. You can do it later. But if you want to just text welcome to that phone number, uh, we'll get you connected with the church and give you more information. And, and we're not perfect. We're far from it. But I'll tell you what. We're trying to be made whole by a holy God and by the power of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing when we we look at that because ultimately God says, hey, I want you to repent so you can be made whole. I want you to repent so that I can give you refreshment. I want you to be able to repent by my power so that you can celebrate that repentance. And each and every week we get to celebrate that refreshment, that repentance by taking communion. And we're going to do that right now of just remembering who God is and what Jesus did. You know, and I know for some of us as we think about communion, maybe you think about all the bad things you did. Maybe you think about all the, all the ways that God is just kind of waiting to condemn you. That's not the picture we get from this, this story of Jesus. 
You go, but, but, but I've been lost. God goes, I'll leave everybody else to come find you. But I'm not worth it. God goes, no, you're of great value. I'll be like that diligent woman cleaning out the house to find it. But you go, but, but you don't know what I've done. And God does. And he still sent Jesus. See, Scripture says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, the righteous for the unrighteous. And God said he just did it for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, that's the God that we serve, and that's the God that we remember each and every time we take communion. So regardless of where you're at or what you've done, God is that watchful Father. And we want to be that church family to help bring you back to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful that, that You are so good. God, I pray that You would just help bring us back. God, maybe some of us have wandered really far and we've left you. We don't know how to come back and we're worried about what people will think. Why? Because just like those Pharisees, sometimes we don't think like you think. And God, I pray that you'd help to change all of our thinking. God, if we're the prideful ones who go, why are, why, why are they here? Why are they trying to do it? That you'd change our thinking. Help us to repent in that. Or if we're the ones thinking, but, but I just don't know. I've done so many bad things. God, when Jesus died, He took all of that on. He took on our pride and our arrogance. He took on our immorality. He took on our addiction. And He said, you can't do this on your own. But I'll stand in the gap for you. I'll help you have a mind change. A paradigm shift and bring you to the one true God. God, we're grateful that we can remember it each and every week at communion that, that it's all about you. God, I pray that we together as a family would help each other make it to heaven and give you glory. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray.